Now let's go ahead and talk about variable winds and sudden wind shifts that we could encounter on takeoff or landing. Now this is especially important at non-towered airports because there's typically less weather reporting information available to us at non-towered airports and overall less traffic, less pilots to advise you of the weather conditions, and you don't have another human being you're talking to to get a takeoff or landing clearance that could advise you as to the most current weather conditions. Now of course we can overfly the airport, we can look at windsocks, we can listen to an AWOS or an ASOS and try to get an idea of what's going on here. There's two reasons that we could possibly encounter either variable winds at an airport or a sudden wind shift. The first reason could be environmental. The wind is actually changing direction or changing speed. The second and more common one is you're encountering mechanical turbulence that something at that airport is causing a steady wind to change speed or direction. And that is what we're going to encounter here as we're approaching to land in Soldovia, Alaska. Now, our big clues as we're coming in here that we're going to have some shifting winds is, first of all, there's a windsock at the approach end of the runway that is nearly limp. The METAR is reporting variable winds at 6, gusting 15, and we can see the windsock at the far end of the runway, or about three quarters of the way down, is totally erect and showing a little bit of a left crosswind. Now, we know that we're having about 15 knots of wind about three quarters of the way down the runway and just off to the side there where the windsock is, but at the approach end of the runway, the windsock is basically limp. Well, what do we do in this case? Aside from looking at some other telltale signs that we'll talk about here more in a minute, we want to now know that we're going to be experiencing some changing gusty winds, and this could be a huge hazard to us. Now, although we may say, okay, are we going to expect a increase in wind? Are we going to expect a decrease in wind? We just expect changing winds and variable winds, and whenever that happens, it's probably a good idea to add a little bit of extra airspeed to your approach speed in case you wind up on the latter side of decreasing performance or losing some airspeed. If we come in a little bit fast and we wind up with a headwind gust, well, now we're really fast and we can simply apply full power and go around and try again. If we come in right on speed and we get a loss of airspeed, instead wind shear or a sudden wind shift that's a decrease in airspeed and we're already at our minimum approach speed, well, now we're in a little bit of a precarious situation where we're adding full power and we're below the speed we want to be flying and we're on the backside of the power curve. So anytime that you're going to be approaching an airport and you suspect variable or gusty winds, either from what you hear on the ASOS or AWOS, or from what the tower tells you, what a METAR says, or the signs you observe on the ground that we'll talk about more here in just a moment. Well, anytime you expect this, good idea to maybe increase your approach speed ever so slightly. Especially if it's gusty winds, we typically take half of the gust factor. In this case, it is six gusting 15, so we'll go ahead and say the gust factor is nine, and we'll add about four to five knots to our approach speed. Now, one thing to consider here is this is an 1800 foot long runway. So with gusty winds and variable winds and adding some speed to my approach, well now I'm going to be using more runway to land, even in the best scenario. So now I need a longer runway surface and this is only 1800 feet. This may cause me to say, well, hey, this runway is just a little too short for me. I want to go somewhere else and maybe go 15 miles away to where there's a 6,000 foot long runway. That would be a safer choice. This doesn't meet my own personal minimums. And although I have to add airspeed because of the variable winds, that makes my landing rollout longer. Or, hey, I can't add airspeed because my landing rollout will be too long and I'm not able to land here safely. Well, in that case, either one, right? We need to go somewhere else. With this short runway and a challenging approach here, the conditions really have to be perfect for us to agree to go ahead and land here. Now, luckily, with a lot of experience, we were ready to go ahead and add a few knots to our approach speed. And if things worked out, we could land. If we wound up going too fast or we got a positive increase in airspeed all of a sudden and it was too great and we weren't able to get the airplane down, we don't want to force the airplane down if we're going too fast, well, then we could simply add full power, go around, and perhaps land somewhere else. Now let's look at this video again and analyze the exact clues we're looking at as we're coming in here. We're watching the treetops bow and we can see the treetops we're flying over aren't moving a whole lot. We're getting rocked around pretty good and that's because of the mechanical turbulence coming off of the mountain and coming off these trees. There's large gaps in the trees. There's areas where the wind is being funneled and increased in airspeed. We're probably experiencing anything from calm winds up to 20 knot gusts through these trees as the wind gets funneled, squeezed and accelerated through those trees and around these buildings. We can look at the water here, and as we pause this and we look at the water, we can see the texture of the water, and we can see shiny flat spots where wind is calm. We can see where the wind is fairly steady through this larger area of nothing really changing. There's no obstacles to cause anything to change there. And then we can see as we continue on that, yeah, there's actually a big gust of wind just further down the runway, about halfway down. There's a large gust of wind to the side, and the water's telling us that. Well, 
Nothing on the runway is telling us that, but we could expect to possibly encounter that, and that's why we add just a few knots of extra speed to our approach. We can also see the windsock, just barely here on the right-hand side as we're coming in, is hanging totally limp, that we saw previously as we flew over, is totally erect out to the side. We know that the wind is still strong at the middle of the runway, and the AWOS is still broadcasting, Winds variable at 6, gusting 15. So the wind's swinging around, and that's largely due to the mechanical influence of this area. We have the runway raised about 5 feet above the water, we have very tall trees, we have a mountain with bald spots on it where there are no trees, and the air is able to kind of flow down the mountain and then hit those trees and change direction, change intensity. So a very unique landscape here that can cause a lot of problems for us. Luckily, the runway is fairly wide. We carry that little bit of extra speed. We make a stable approach still. We get ourselves down to the runway, slowly reduce power, and realize, hey, we're in a calm area right now. We'll let the wheels get on. As the wheels get on the ground, we chop power to idle, and we allow the airplane to slowly decelerate, applying the brakes and retracting our flaps, so we stick to the ground. At this point, once we're on the ground for just a few seconds, we've dissipated enough energy by applying the brakes and retracting the flaps and retarding the power to idle that the airplane will stick even with a small gust of wind hitting us. Now you may say that's great and all, but I really don't fly in Alaska. I don't fly around these crazy mountains and short runways and all this stuff. I fly in Florida where it's flat. Well, in Florida where it's flat, they still build awfully big buildings and big FBOs and big hangars. And you can see here with the wind flowing at a 45 degree angle, really, as we look at the windsock, 45 degree angle to the hangars, it's actually blowing straight between the hangars, blowing backwards on the back side of the hangar where there's a little bit of mechanical turbulence from that hangar. And then further out in the field and towards the runway, it's blowing at a 45 degree angle to the orientation of the hangars. So lots of variable winds here. And do you think that's reported on the AWOS or ASOS? No, where the AWOS or ASOS station is, is fairly straightforward. The winds are blowing steady in one direction, but blowing in a different direction near these hangars. So anytime you have large trees or buildings or anything like that near a runway and you're going to be landing downwind of them, something to really consider how the winds might shift on you and what you want to do to alter your approach to be able to execute it safely. If you find yourself saying, well, I don't want to add any extra airspeed to my approach because this is a short, difficult runway and I won't be able to land here then, well, then maybe it's just not a runway you need to go to in those conditions. Maybe you need to wait for calmer conditions and go to a different runway that doesn't have those obstacles and those features causing variable winds or potentially causing variable winds or wind shifts while you're trying to land or take off or simply go to an airport with a larger, wider, longer runway where you'd have more room for error. Now let's take a look at an example of environmental wind shift or variable winds. So here we have Florida, right? The steady sea breeze that blows every day on the west coast of Florida, it comes in off the Gulf of Mexico as the center of the state heats, the air rises in the center of the state, it pulls in that cooler air off the Gulf and feeds all that nice warm moist air into these big old thunderstorms we experience every single afternoon in Florida in the summertime. We can see that the windsock is pointing towards the thunderstorms. Those things are rising, pulling air vertically upward, sucking the air in horizontally off the Gulf of Mexico. All is well, we have a nice steady sea breeze, great for flight training. Until about somewhere around 3.30 or 4 p.m., when these thunderstorms really build to their mature stage and start raining and dissipating that energy, and now they start reversing the flow of air. Instead of pulling air in off the gulf and making that air rise vertically and sucking air in, now they are expelling that air. It is coming straight down to the ground, hitting the ground, and then moving back out towards the Gulf of Mexico, reversing the wind direction. Now, when a thunderstorm is near the airport, you could have a nice steady 10, 12, 15, even 20 knot wind blowing towards the thunderstorm as it builds rapidly and sucks that air in. The more rapidly it builds and sucks the air in, the more violent it's going to be when it expels the air back down. And if it's near the airport, you could easily have that 10 or 12 knot headwind change direction over the course of your takeoff roll to a 15, 20, or even 30 knot tailwind. That could be very, very dangerous for you if you're trying to take off, and of course very, very dangerous if you're trying to land. It's important to recognize these environmental factors, such as thunderstorms, that could cause a very sudden wind shift from the outflow of the storm and never be operating near thunderstorms for takeoff or landing. We typically like to give them about a 20 nautical mile radius to operate from them. In Florida, that can be tough in the afternoons, but hey, that's why we fly in the mornings in Florida in the summertime. If it's noon or 1 p.m. in Florida and the thunderstorms are just starting to build, they haven't started to rain in the middle of the state yet at all, they're just building up, well, you can probably count on some steady sea breezes to maybe possibly take off and leave the area and go somewhere where it's forecast to be clear. But if it's later in the day 
and you see these storms have been building all day and you see some rain falling in the distance or it looks like the rain is about to start following or the storm is getting near the airport within 20 nautical miles of it, it's a good idea to just stay on the ground or if you're in the air looking for a place to land, to find a different place to land. If the winds are calm on the ground and you have to land, you never have to take off. So we're going to avoid the whole emergency takeoff scenario here. But say you have a really important reason to land, like you're low on fuel and there's no other airports nearby. And the winds are reported to be calm, but there is a thunderstorm somewhere in the area, 10, 15, 20 miles away. Would highly recommend you choosing a runway that aligns you to land towards the storm. That way, if there is any outflow from the storm, you will probably get increasing performance in a headwind rather than a tailwind on final when you're trying to land. You can say, yes, but what if the storm is really close to the airport and I have to go around, I'm going to fly right into it. Well, if the storm is that close to the airport that you would fly into it on a go around, you shouldn't be at that airport anyways. And hopefully you carry enough fuel in your tanks, you could make it to an alternate airport with thunderstorms much, much farther away, right? So 20 nautical miles is a good distance to keep them away from us. And the steady sea breeze we can count on every day in the summertime in Florida to pull all that air up in the middle of the state and cause that westerly winds to blow, pulling in that warm, moist air off the Gulf, typically reverses sometime in the afternoon as the thunderstorms start raining out their energy and goes slack and then reverses direction depending on how close that thunderstorm is to the airport is how quickly and how violently that wind will reverse direction to where it could be a nice slow wind reversal over the course of an hour or it could happen just over the course of about 10 to 15 seconds. Ultimately the things we're looking out here for are this. We're looking for environmental factors like thunderstorms or any other sort of environmental factors that could cause sudden wind shifts for us. Rain, virga, anything like that. We're also looking at the mechanical features of the terrain. Mountains, trees, hangars, buildings, a runway that's raised on top of a slope, perhaps a runway like this that we approach and the wind is blowing towards us. We have a headwind, but we get sink as we approach the runway and that is pulling us down. We have that sudden wind shift vertically from a nice horizontal wind to all of a sudden some vertical movement that's trying to pull us down into the cliff face and we have to add a lot of power to overcome that. So here we chose to make our approach expecting that with strong winds and this cliff face, we made our approach much higher and carried an extra power to try to stay above that and carry in some extra energy, knowing that we had enough runway length to dissipate that. If we were concerned with the runway length, carrying in that extra power and approaching higher, we simply wouldn't even try to land there. So there's some ideas for you of how variable winds or sudden wind shifts can affect you in the airplane, some ideas of how to detect those. And ultimately, if you ever are in doubt, just err on the side of caution, go to places that don't have these features, and bigger, longer runways that are wider and give you more room for error. Always stack that deck in your favor.